<laughs> wow, well this is so long anticipated. It's a real joy uh, for us to be with you all. We know that uh, Father Matt is such a good father to you all, but he's a really good brother to us. So the idea of being uh, amongst those whom he's entrusted to is also a joy for us. Not to mention we're coming from New York and our first fall in uh, Phoenix was rough. People were like, it's autumn. We're like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> where? <laughs> <laughs> and then we came up to Flagstaff and one sister who shall remain nameless cried when we got up here last year because she was like, the trees, the trees. I was like, it's so beautiful. It's so, so beautiful up here. So we're just so happy to be, yeah, be in your midst and have this time with you. And yeah, just thinking about this topic, forgiveness, mercy, it's, it's both exhilarating and there's something um, like I can taste the hope and the freedom uh, that lies therein. Um, and simultaneously, it kind of touches on, on my heart and my history and some, some of the painful, painful places, just thinking about these, these topics. But I just want you to think about, there's just nothing like um, someone forgiving you. There really isn't. When, when, you, when you make a mistake, when you say a harsh word, when you didn't show up, when you failed in some way, when you know that you hurt someone else, and you receive this gift to um, experience your own weakness, your own kind of pathetic um, capacity to be able to, um, yeah, hit the mark or uh, respond correctly every time. And you bring that, you bring an apology to someone and they forgive you. There is something so beautiful about that. There's something so uniting, so bonding, so healing, so like, um, yeah, just experientially, there's nothing like it. It's kind of like there's nothing like a good confession, like the kind where it's like sometimes you're like choking to get the words out and you have to pause to regain yourself so the Father can actually hear what you're saying and then the multiple tears, the tissues, the nose blowing. This kind of a confession where there's like a release of something I have been carrying that I was never meant to carry and I'm not able to carry. Um, actually, that Jesus wanted and that he gave me the grace uh, to be able to articulate so that I could be free. So it's just nothing like mercy. And uh, Jesus knew that. Um, I love that it's Jesus who gave us the sacrament. He said to the apostles, what sins you forgive are forgiven, and what sins you retain are retained. He gave them the power to stand in his place and to forgive sins because he knew we needed to hear it. We needed to hear, um, you are forgiven. I absolve you. You know, a priest sits in the person of, of Jesus when he is in the confessional. Jesus knew we needed to hear it and wanted to hear it and so desired and needed to hear it. Uh, so I thought we could start with a couple confession bloopers just to kind of, you know, get us in the mood for, for this topic. But uh, a priest shared this story with us and we just loved it. So um, a flustered young mother was rushing to the confessional, several young children outside, people attempting to, to corral them while she made her confession. Uh, she gets in there, and rather than saying uh, the norm, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned, she says, oh, Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts which we are about to receive. And from the other side of the screen, she hears kind of a timid, Are you going to eat me? <laughs> oh. We had another sister who was kind of confused that someone didn't tell her she was next in line. She looked and saw the confessional open and she went in and you could either sit behind the screen or sit in front of Father and she, she chose the anonymous route and went behind the screen, closed the door. And she began her confession and just let everything out, like um, all the details just her, of her heart and, and um, she heard silence. And uh, she, she was like, well, um, Father, uh, well, what, what actually happened, and then she's like starting to tell the backstory and like kind of like how the person kind of deserved what happened. So she's not even sure if she's culpable of that one, you know. And like, and by the end of it, um, there's a little knock at the door, and she's like, so rude. Like, I'm in the middle of my confession. Like, come on, like whatever can wait. Turns around, opens the door. It's Father. He went to the bathroom, and she just <laughs> made her confession to no one and nothing. So um, he took his seat, and um, the, the, anonym, the anonymous portion of the, the confession was gone. But um, she made her confession and received absolution. Um, another sister who is here but shall remain nameless um, couldn't figure out the ancient European confessional with the ornate wood. So she began like going around it and like trying to like unhinge things to like figure out how to get inside 
of this place of mercy and enter into the throne. Um, and so she's going around. She's like, like really forcibly. Um, I mean, it's very antique, actually. Um, she accidentally opens the door where Father is within, and he's like, "Oh!" And she's like, "No!" And then she gets she gets to the other side. She actually gets in, and she's like, "Father, forgive me for I am stupid." <laughs> And then I'll never forget my first confession at the age of seven. So all of the kids of my class were lined up outside the confessional. And I have two brothers, so um, I, had, I had a lot stored up that this is my first time being able to really be released of, of the burden that I'd been carrying of, of things I had done and failed to do uh, to my brothers. And so when I got in there, I also didn't know how the screen worked. And so I stood on the kneeler. I didn't know where father was. Um, and at a certain point, he just said, could you please lower your voice? <laughs> because I was yelling my confession. And when I came out so triumphant and like cleansed, um, I did realize that every classmate had heard, had heard the confession. And so it was a public, it was a public confession. And, and uh, my penance was part of yeah, receiving that humiliation. But tonight, I do not want to lower my voice. I'm going to raise my voice to the heavens uh, about the mercy, the mercy of Jesus and God's forgiveness and the fact that he gave us a capacity to be able to accept his forgiveness, to be able to bestow forgiveness on others and to be able to forgive ourselves, which is, is not always talked about, but really is, is, a, is a serious struggle and is something that we, we often... Um, often uh, don't know how to articulate and, and they, it can hold us, hold us bound. So I um, thought we could just start with a prayer and open ourselves up to, to this gift. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Father, we bless you. Uh, we thank you. We love you. I thank you for loving us so much uh, that you didn't want to lose us uh, when we had fallen away from you, when we had disobeyed when we had chosen ourselves. Thank you for sending your son Jesus uh, to be one of us, uh, to walk in our midst, to reveal your face and the beauty of how you see us and how you love us. And I just ask, Father, in the name of your son Jesus for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon every person in this room. Come upon us, Holy Spirit. You who know our thoughts and our hearts and our histories, we just invite you and welcome you uh, to stir us up to deeply desire, uh, desire to receive the Lord's mercy and accept it and revel in it, really rejoice in it. The desire to be freed of any unforgiveness, uh, the desire to release ourselves uh, from shame and um, any burden that we're carrying. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. There's some Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. So I, I recently started reading an excellent book. Um, it was co-written by a Catholic priest and a Catholic therapist. And it's entitled Choosing Forgiveness. Um, I do have to say I became very tempted to like give you a complete synopsis of the book. And the sisters were like, how's your talk coming along? And I was like, well, I mean, there's, a, there's like eight parts to it. Um, I do have to ask Father Matt to make it a two-hour talk now that... Uh, you know, I have this whole like expose, you know, to do on forgiveness. And they're like, maybe just refer to it and they can like look it up. I'm like, oh, good call. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe they can read the book and I don't have to read it out loud to them <laughs> in the course of the talk. So choosing forgiveness. And so that's what I'm going to kind of come through tonight. Um, touch on our fallen and redeemed humanity and the gift and grace of divine mercy. Um, and also just some of the practicals and some of the inspiring testimonies and witnesses that we see of mercy and forgiveness. So the first point I want to make is just that God loves us so much that um, he created us and he knows our nature and he knows our fallen nature and he sent his son to redeem our nature so that we could be divinized and like him. So God himself um, is not scandalized by our, our weakness and our humanity. He, he loves it very much, actually. So he's never like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? What in the world were you, you know? He's, he's um, tender and compassionate and he meets us in the, in the, um, in the wound and in the, place, in the place of weakness. He wants to meet us there to, to elevate us. And there's just something beautiful thinking about when the angels fell from grace, uh, God didn't send his son to become an angel to save them. But when Adam and Eve fell, when our first parents fell, 
uh, God couldn't bear to be separated from us. And he actually promises a savior immediately. And he sends his son to become man and then to take upon himself um, all of our experiences. Jesus experienced everything we experienced except sin, but he did become sin on the cross to nail sin uh, to the cross so that sin could be conquered uh, and overcome and so that he could uh, allow us to uh, experience a redemption of our very bodies and our very natures to become divinized. So all that to be said, yeah, God is not scandalized by us or disgusted by us or horrified or anything that we can feel towards ourselves or towards sin or towards the sin of others. The Lord um, has a very different vision and gaze on that uh, and how he can receive us. Um, so painful experiences, betrayal, disappointment, sin, these are daily realities, right? And we, we really do um, often live ashamed of our poverty. Uh, we resist the fact that we're so dependent and we often try to protect ourselves from suffering. And the Lord wants us to um, willingly uh, approach him, as Father said in his homily so beautifully, like approach that fire that purifies, that is love. Um, I'm going to speak from experience of a time I had to forgive myself and uh, just go from there. But um, I almost lost my vocation as a sister of life when I was a novice after a failure and a battle to forgive myself. So um, as a novice, I was preparing for my first vows and I was serving in our crisis pregnancy mission. And I was given a 16-year-old uh, to call and accompany and be with um, who was very tempted to abortion. And I did not know what to say or what to do, and I did not ask for help. And I just um, kind of dove into it, and I got on the phone with her. And the conversation um, went sour, and at a certain point she didn't want to hear any, any more of what I had to say and hung up on me and then never answered my phone calls again. So. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola has 14 rules to know if a movement in your heart is coming from God or if it's coming from the evil one, the enemy. It's called the, the discernment of spirits. And his 14th rule says that when the enemy looks at you, he sees you like a fortress and he looks for a crack. And if he sees a weak place in your fortress, he like kind of bludgeons that crack so that he can find entryway. And so I guess the enemy, when he was looking at me, he saw I was extremely insecure about being able uh, to serve pregnant women. And I didn't, I didn't um, know if I could do that. And I also uh, was self-reliant. I thought I, I should have the right thing to say and know what to say just naturally, that that should come to me naturally. And so he kind of just mm, went right for that to gain entrance. And yeah, he stepped into a place of accusation and began suggesting to me, he's like, oh my gosh, this is all your fault. Um, she had the abortion. I mean, had any other sister taken that call, she would have come in and that baby would be alive today, but you took it. You know, you could never be a sister of life. I mean, you lose the pieces that are supposed to be picked up. Um, the enemy, he's an accuser and shame and blame are like his signature on something. So whenever you experience accusation, uh, shame or blame, you can, you can know that that's his trademark and that you can reject and resist that. Uh, but I did not realize that uh, that's what was happening and I actually believed a lot of what was being said to me. So I went through a time of real agony and I couldn't believe I had messed up so badly. And I didn't know how I could live with myself. I actually was like, oh my gosh, somebody's life depended on me. And I um, failed. Like, I don't, and then I was like, I don't think I can do this repeatedly. Like, I, you know, I think I might need to leave the convent. I mean, I think I need to like get on a bus or like leave on a jet plane and not know when I was coming back again. I mean, it just, I didn't know what to do. So I started play, uh, praying a novena to the Holy Spirit. It was Pentecost and I just basically said, Holy Spirit, um, I'm gonna leave just because I feel like I have to. And um, in these next nine days, I need you to speak a word to me. And I don't really care who it is. It could be a homeless person, it could be a cashier, it could be, you know, like I, I have no, no concern about who it is. I, I just need a word. And so um, I remember uh, on the last day of the novena, I was at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City and I was crying at the crypt of our founder, Cardinal O'Connor, who's like, you know, if you need help, go to dad. And I was like, dad. And a priest saw me and he uh, came up to me and he was like, I was a mess. And he, he just put his hand on me and he was like, oh, sister, like, what a shame. You know, like the ugly crying and like that. I'm like, hello. And he was like, 
Oh, sister, I have this red hair, but I can't do the Irish brogue. It's like one of the saddest parts of my, <laughs> of my life. He had a beautiful Irish brogue, and he's like, sister, is Jesus asleep in your boat? And I was like, I didn't even know how to answer that. I was like, hmm. <laughs> and he goes, oh, do you know what St. Therese would say? And me and St. Therese, I love her, but it's kind of like this, like one of these like wrestling match, kind of a love, like, you know, arm wrestle, sort of a undercut, kind of like hug, sort of a relationship. So I was like, what would St. Therese say? <laughs> and he said, get Jesus a pillow. Get him a pillow if he's sleeping in your boat. And for as mysterious as it is, and for as kind of um, unexpected as it is, it was the perfect word. And I realized that here I was in my boat in this storm, and I really thought Jesus didn't care about me, or this little girl, or her baby, and I, I did not know what to do with that. And the thought of getting him a pillow and kind of joining him was um, really an invitation to trust and to let go and uh, to permit him to guide me through this storm instead of me jump ship. So I found him on the boat. <laughs> I lifted up his drowsy arm. I tucked myself under it and I put his arm back down. And I was like, if you're sleeping, so am I, you know, like, and I'm going to sleep my way through this. And the storm passed. And 12 years later, I was asked to begin the crisis mission, um, pregnancy mission here in Phoenix with my team. And uh, Jesus redeems everything, right? He redeems everything. And I, I marvel that he would trust me um, and, and be with me and allow me to live that. So um, I really did, yeah, we have to release ourselves. Sometimes um, we can be really hard on ourselves, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty. So like when I look back on something, I'm like, I should have known, I should have seen. Why didn't I realize? And, and it's so plain, it's so clear. And it's like, well, in the moment it wasn't. And I didn't know what the ramifications were going to be. And I didn't know, realize how grave it was. And, and we can be, yeah, super hard and harsh with ourselves. And Jesus is not like this. We can transfer it onto him and think that he sees us the same way. We just assume he's, he's harsh too. Um, and I remember one time the Lord really, really coming to me and my understanding of him being harsh. I was, I was on one of my eight-day retreats of silence. And I was praying with uh, the first resurrection appearance where Jesus comes into the upper room and the 11 apostles are there and hiding and scared and terrified. And Judas is not there because he's fallen into despair and taken his own life. But Jesus walks in and I'm praying with it and it says, he says, peace be with you. He, he brings peace. He's got the wounds. He walks through the walls. And they all are, it says, in, like incredulous with joy and seeing them. And I, I just paused and I was like, what? And I became kind of like a movie director in this meditation. I like had the cool hat and the chair and I was like, I got up and I was like, whoa, 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 cut, 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 cut. And Jesus was like, wait, wait. I was like, oh, could you, could you come to the side? I need to talk to the cast. And I was like, um, guys, wow. Um, incredulous with joy. I was like, does anyone remember Friday? <laughs> Peter, um, where were you about, I don't know, 3 p.m.? Uh, anything coming in? No? Um, Cock-a-doodle do? Peter, you know? I'm like, okay. Uh, Thomas, yeah, no clue. Oh, yeah, well, Thomas isn't even here. What's going on? You know, and then like the whole thing, just being able to um, talk to everybody. I was like, you know, um, John, you're okay. Okay, you slow motion hug. Go ahead. Yeah, go in, <laughs> reunite, uh, whatever. But um, yeah, Matthew, didn't see you. Um, we're, we're, I don't know. Guys, what I want to see, wailing, gnashing of teeth, grinding, throwing yourself on the floor. I, I, I don't know, like sobbing. Um, you should be ashamed of yourselves, um, mostly because you <laughs> like what, what you've done. And the Lord literally came over and like put his hand on me in, in my meditation. He was like, hey, hey. And I was like, oh, me? What? I'm kind of in the middle of something. <laughs> you know? And he was like, come here. And he said, um, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe we'll go back to the original, you know, scene and kind of how you wrote it. Yeah, let's, let's go back. Okay, everyone do what you did before, you know. Uh, I'm not like that. And it's so beautiful that these men who betrayed Jesus at the time he needed them the most, whom he was so close, I mean, every waking and sleeping moment for three years, like, heard his heart, saw him, saw him go through everything. Um, yeah, his closest, beloved. Uh, apostles, um, and they, they left. They even denied, Peter denied knowing him. He's like, I don't even know the man. I, I, never, I never saw him before in my life. I mean, 
Yeah, out of fear. And his first words to them were peace. And they knew him. So they didn't wail and gnash their teeth and throw themselves on the ground. They knew that he would forgive them. That's why they could be joyful. That's why they could celebrate his return. They knew him, and I didn't. It was so beautiful to realize that um, Jesus sees us. He sees our goodness. He sees our desires. He sees our weakness, and he is not ashamed of our weakness. He actually wants to come into that and give us a strength that is not our own. John Paul II said at World Youth Day in Toronto, um, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of his son. I'm going to say that again. We are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of his son. Sometimes we really define ourselves by uh, what we have done or what has been done to us that was sinful and do not claim our truest identity, which is to be beloved daughters and sons, loved by the Father, claimed, fought for, um, redeemed by Jesus, and to become like Jesus in our lives. Uh, Jason Everett wrote a book on John Paul II called um, John Paul II's Five Loves. And there's a story in there that I want to share that's about mercy that is stunning. Um, John Paul II's mercy. So I'm going to quote it. But while walking a few blocks from the Vatican, a Monsignor from the Archdiocese of New York recognized a beggar on the steps of the church in Rome. The two had been in seminary together. The poor man admitted to this Monsignor that he had crashed and burned in his vocation and he had actually left the priesthood. The priest managed to arrange for this poor man to meet with the Pope. When the two were alone, instead of probing for details about the poor man's fall from the priesthood, the Holy Father clasped his hands and asked him to hear his confession. The priest dropped to his knees um, and objected and he said, I'm a beggar. To which Pope John Paul II replied, so am I. <laughs> With that, the fallen away priest heard the Pope's confession and absolved him of his sins. The priest then uh, asked the Holy Father to absolve him as well. After the confessions, John Paul II remarked, do you see the grandeur of the priesthood? Don't besmirk it. Um, after that, the Holy Father, um, having reinstated this priest and having, uh, help, helping him rehabilitate uh, and come back to his priesthood, the Holy Father assigned this priest to a nearby parish to minister to the homeless. Uh, he wrote this in Veritatis Splendor. No human sin can erase the mercy of God or prevent him from unleashing all his triumphant power if we only call upon him. If we only call upon him, the mercy of God to see us in our, in our uh, ugliest and poorest and saddest and to reach out and draw us back in. It's really something to witness those who have received mercy and can speak of it and proclaim it and they radiate, they, they radiate something. Um, I remember listening at World Youth Day um, in Madrid to, does, is anyone here familiar with Jason and Kristalina Evert? If, if, can I just see a show of hands just to, just to know? Okay, so they're pretty renowned chastity speakers like worldwide and they actually live in Scottsdale, which is amazing. Um, but I'll never forget watching Jason and Kristalina both share their stories with like tens of thousands of teenagers. And so Jason went first and Jason was just sharing that while he knew uh, he wanted to save himself for marriage, uh, he had struggled with a pornography addiction as a young man and really suffered that and fought that and battled that, bringing that to the Lord, asking for freedom and healing. And when he finished his testimony, um, his wife, they kind of switched places, you know, grabbed hands. And Jason, I watched him as she began her story. I watched him silently pray the rosary for his wife as she was sharing her testimony. It was extremely moving because you could tell he was like, upholding her, knowing what she was about to say. And Kristalina shared her story that she came from a broken family, um, 
divorce with her own parents and then affairs just in the extended family that she had seen. Um, her vir virginity was lost, was stolen um, at the age of 15. She said it really distorted and destroyed her experience of relationships and she just lost respect for herself and started diving into, yeah, the, the partying, clubbing, uh, promiscuous lifestyle. And at a certain point, her, her mom uh, saw she was just trying to numb the pain um, and asked her to come to an event at the church and hear, hear a chastity speaker, just one, like, please do this for me. And she was like, mom, come on, please, so boring. I totally have other plans. And her mom's like, one night for me, like one night. Um, and Kristalina shared within 15 minutes of hearing um, whoever the young man was, share his testimony of um, chastity and being able to ask the Lord for the grace of a second virginity and um, coming into the life of grace afresh and living free and pure uh, with a new, a new fresh start. Kristalina was like, oh my gosh, he's not ashamed. And she knew how, how ashamed she was of herself. And she's like, I don't want to be ashamed anymore. And he inspired her to go to confession and to take Jesus at his word. The Lord said, behold, I make all things new. And she was like, I want that. And she became a new creation. And um, she began giving chastity talks. And she began reaching out. And that's how she and Jason, her husband, met. And here they are, married, eight children later, giving their, giving their testimony to, to really, you know, I think over a million people, honestly. Um, just knowing like God's radiant mercy in this couple that they're, they can, you can, we can all be wounded healers, you know, and others can receive so deeply from what we've, we've been able to drink from, which is the, the stream of delight, which is the pierced heart of the Savior, which is his divine mercy, which is an, he, he revealed to St. Faustina as an ocean. He's like, I have an ocean of mercy that I just want to pour out upon you. Yeah, so Jesus, yeah, Jesus is not harsh. He's patient. He entrusts himself to us, and he has very creative ways of revealing his merciful love. Um, one story from us in Phoenix, our pregnancy mission, which was really neat, um, Layla's story, I'll call her Layla. She was pregnant and scared, and she was panicking, and she was on her iPhone, and she was trying to find pregnancy resources, and, and you know, not sure where to go or where to turn. And she, act, you know how you can accidentally call a business by accident? I don't know, so she called us and didn't realize she had. And one of the sisters saw a missed call, and so just texted that number back, hey, we're the Sisters of Life. We walk with women who are pregnant. We'd love to be with you and, and support you. So she, if you can imagine, she didn't know she had called us. And then suddenly she gets a text that says, hey, we're the Sisters of Life. We walk with she was like, ah. Like it was like a message from above. And she's Protestant. So when she came to our convent, I'll never forget it. We opened the door. We were like, hey. And she was like, whoa. <laughs> like, I think when people hear sisters, they think we're like sisters or like we're like, I don't know, like, like sister. For, I don't know what they think. But if you're not Catholic, you might not know what you're about to get into. And she was like, I knew I needed something faith-based, but this is like extreme. And uh, we brought her into our, our convent and we, you know, ate grilled cheese sandwiches and she cried and we, we cried with her. We laughed. And by the end of it, um, yeah, she was stunned that, that God had kind of scooped her up. And later, as we walked with her in her pregnancy, she was sharing, again, deeply Christian, deeply ashamed of herself, um, but coming to a greater freedom knowing God sees her. She was sharing with a sister. Uh, she was like, I think my baby's name is Matthias. It keeps coming on my heart. I don't know why. Matthias keeps coming over and over again. I don't know what that's all about. And uh, I had stepped out to go make her lunch, and I came back in to this conversation. But the sister was like, well, you know who Matthias is, right? She was like, no, who's Matthias? And she's like, well, after Judas betrayed Jesus, you know, and he fell into despair and he took his own life, uh, they, they needed to choose another apostle to step into that place. And they chose, they, you know, drew straws and chose Matthias. So he was the new apostle. And she was like totally moved to like silence and tears by this. And I walk in and, and sister's like, bye. And I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's a mess. And she paused and she looked at me and she said, sister, I betrayed Jesus. I betrayed Jesus by acting like a fool and by doing what I was doing. And I cannot believe that in place of the betrayal, he's given me a Matthias to step into that place. And I was like, whoa. I said, Layla, you are not Judas, first of all. I was like, second of all, 
Um, that is so profound. And what was even more amazing is her baby uh, came a week earlier than his due date and was born on Spy Wednesday, which is the day of Holy Week in which Judas betrays Jesus. And so this little Matthias actually came into the betrayal uh, to be a consolation to the heart of God. So I'm like, wow, there's an anointing upon this child. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's amazing. So that's one story. Um, I just finished another book. I don't read that much, so I'm like so proud that I can tell you that I'm like finishing all these books. Um, it's called Impossible Marriages Redeemed. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's the story of suffering, struggling marriages, and the redemption that enters into the brokenness of, um, yeah, of either couples that did divorce or did separate or were on the brink of it. Um, I was actually sucker punched by these stories because I was so moved by these men and women who could extend an unimaginable, like um, truly godlike mercy to their spouse and forgive them the debt that they incurred through infidelity or addiction or abandonment. I just was stunned to see that so many of them just said that God poured a supernatural love into my heart to be faithful to my vows and to be faithful to my spouse, to truly want their good. Um, I was very moved that God's mercy uh, could, yeah, go to that distance. We hear often forgive and forget, uh, but that's not true, and that's not really possible. Uh, forgiveness is a process, and it, it often needs to be renewed uh, to deepen, in order to deepen. I remember a friend of mine in high school, um, his parents divorced when we were 18, and I'll just know, I was so edified by him. He was like describing how he navigates that, and he's like, I get up in the morning, and I forgive my parents. I get up in the morning and I forgive my parents. And it's like his first act of the day. Um, so beautiful to renew this act of the will, even though I still have these emotions that are attached to whatever the hurt was. Um, this is especially true when you do not receive an apology from someone or cannot receive an apology from someone. Sometimes it's not possible because of distance or death even. Um, sometimes it's not prudent to re-engage someone who has hurt us, but we still want to forgive them. And just to recognize that God can work in all of that. Um, and there's, of course, especially, um, there, there is a, a space and a place for healthy separation from someone who wounds, um, you know, and being able to recognize that healthy boundaries are something to, to have in place with abuse, violence, manipulation, and things like that. Uh, but forgiving likens us to Christ. It actually allows us to enter into his words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, we become truly um, with the grace given to us as, as baptized Christians. We can truly imitate, imitate the Lord in, in a way that is, is um, continuing the redemption of the world in some ways. I want to share the story of... Uh, and are you all familiar with the story of St. Maria Goretti? Or are some of you familiar with it? Maybe show of hands if you don't mind, just so I can do a little background. That's okay. She's an Italian saint. So she was 12 years old. Um, her father had passed away, and her mom was, like, trying to uphold the farm. And there was a gentleman and his son who were farmhands, like, helping with the farm. And this, old, this son of his um, was making a lot of inappropriate and sexual advances to Maria, who was only 12. And uh, she, she ignored, she fought, and then one day he, he did attempt to rape her, and she fought, she fought him off and was like, Alessandro, no, it's a sin, no, you'll go to hell, no, like, no. And he, he stabbed her, and um, she passed away from the wounds about uh, um, a little bit after that, uh, but on her deathbed was able to forgive him. She was like, I forgive him, and I want him to be in heaven with me, like, I forgive Alessandro. And he was very embittered. He went to jail and um, he was going to serve um, like a lifetime sentence. And at some point within his sentence, um, Maria Goretti appeared to him in a dream. And she was holding 14 lilies, one for each of the stab wounds. And she handed him 14 lilies one by one to reveal to him like, I forgive you that, I forgive you that, I forgive you that, I forgive you that. He was so radically transformed by this act of mercy from, from the other side uh, and so converted that he, he, had to serve, he was given a, a lesser sentence because of the radical transformation they saw in him and he only had to serve like 30 years or something like that. And um, 
When he got out, he went to go see Maria's mother. So when Maria Goretti died, now her mother had lost her husband, Maria, and couldn't like take care of all her children. So actually Maria's siblings were placed into like foster care uh, and adopted out. So really Maria's death really was like, Maria's mom lost everything uh, through this, this act. So Alessandra comes to the door of Maria's mother um, to ask for her forgiveness. And she welcomes him in, forgives him, and treats him like a son to her. And uh, at her canonization uh, in St. Peter's in Rome, her mother and Alessandro sat next to each other when Maria Gretti was made, made a saint. Uh, it's just un, yeah, <laughs> unbelievable to recognize the, the, really the lengths, uh, the miraculous lengths that God goes uh, to heal us and to free us. Um, really beautiful. I think if we pray, when we hear a story like that, it can be so extreme that we're kind of like, oh my gosh, I don't even know if I have any capacity like that or I don't know what would be possible for me or I don't know if I could, like, like Maria's mom, do something like that and forgive her. But we really do want to pray like, Lord, increase my desire. Increase my desire to be merciful. Make me want to be more merciful. Increase me, my desire to receive your mercy more deeply into my own, my own wounds. Um, there are a few things that kind of keep us from this mercy and keep us, prevent us from receiving mercy and the Lord's forgiveness. And I just think it's really important to be able to call things by their proper name. Um, when I entered the convent uh, 16 years ago, one of my classmates was from New Zealand and she picked up that um, Americans call things by their brand name instead of their actual name. And so she kind of picked up on that and she, you know, like, um, I don't know, do, do you need a Kleenex or um, could you put that in a Ziploc or yeah, hand me a Sharpie so I can write that down, you know. So she was like, okay, I get it, you know. And so one day we were in a stuffy, like, lecture hall listening to, like, a talk that would not end. And it was post-lunch, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to pass out. Like, how humiliating is this? And I, my fellow postulant leans over to me and whispers, I could really use some scotch. <laughs> and I'm like, say what? I'm like, I'm, I'm like... I mean, so could I, but I would never say that out loud. <laughs> and I looked down at her, and she's holding her torn notebook, like indicating to me she could really use some scotch tape. Um, and I just had to explain to her that some things really do need their object attached, like just to honor, like just for future reference. Um, but just to name a few things, I'm just going to go through them. So the first one that can keep us from receiving God's mercy is fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Um, it's a tactic of the enemy to make you think you can't approach God or approach the confessional because you will be judged, condemned, receive the brunt of his anger, or punished. And I love to think of the woman caught in adultery when I think of the enemy trying to use fear because here she is, a woman caught in the very act of adultery, thrown before Jesus. Jesus kneels. He's drawing in the sand. All of the Pharisees are like, she deserves to be stoned, like killed for what she has done. What do you say, Jesus? And the Lord is so beautiful. First of all, he's, he gets to her level. He stoops. And uh, he says to the crowd, let the one among you who has no sin, go ahead and throw the first stone at her. You get to throw the first stone if you've never sinned. And it says one by one they left, beginning with the elders. Drop the stones. And it's almost playful what Jesus says to her, the way that he addresses her. He's like, you know, they're all gone. And he's like, has no one condemned you? And she's probably like, no. <laughs> like, it must have been like such a nightmarish, beautiful dream blend, you know? She's like, no. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, you know? And releases her, frees her, and teaches everyone something about judgment. Uh, when we go to confession, whatever we confess is literally blotted out by God and wiped away. Uh, priests have heard it all, so it's not like you can like surprise a priest. Like, you know, you can just get over that. Um, yeah, that you're so creative. You know, actually, <laughs> they, they've they've heard it all. So, um, and if anything, the bigger the sin or the the harder it would be to speak it out. Like the greater the privilege on behalf of the priest to be able to receive that in Jesus' place, knowing the grace that you're receiving to even bring it forward, uh, how deeply Jesus wants you to be set free from that. And so it's actually just a privilege. So fear lies. St. Augustine believed him for years. He was very torn about breaking free of his sexual addictions. Um, 
And he mentioned that the temptations would taunt him. You cannot live without us, is what he was hearing. But something was telling him this isn't true life. And he heard a voice say of the scriptures, take and read, take and read. And he opened up the scriptures to St. Paul's letter. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy, rather put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. As soon as he read that, he knew he wanted true life. He wanted to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do think, where would we be had he not crossed that bridge and broken free of that addiction? Bringing it to the light, we would not have a bishop and a doctor of the church, one of the most eloquent speakers on mercy. Shame is the other one. Shame keeps us from receiving. Shame is like that chokehold um, that keeps us from, it keeps us in darkness, shrouded in secrecy. And the Lord in his goodness knows that and he gives us this sacrament of confession as a life-saving remedy for death-dealing shame. He wants us to be able to bring it forward uh, to be freed because shame, in order to kill shame, you need empathy. You need to be able to give it voice. I'm going to share a story. One of the women in our our hope and healing mission. Um, she, she had suffered two abortions in her young adult life, and she shared about the day that she received a major grace to go to confession for the first time in 29 years. And she'd made an appointment with her parish priest, and as she drove, she said the battle was on. And I'm gonna use her words, this is quoting her. She said, I'm clutching the steering wheel when suddenly I started hearing a whisper. You don't have to do this. <laughs> What about the second abortion? Are you going to tell him about that one? I mean, you don't have to. Why are you making this so hard on yourself? Just go home. Just turn around. She said, I was fighting so hard through this, crying and praying the only prayer she knew, which was the Hail Mary. So she said, I felt so much conflict and terror because I just couldn't get over that second abortion. And she said, where is this coming from? She said, I lashed back. No! Hail Mary, full of grace. I want to heal. Hail Mary, full of grace. She said, I got there in tears, and Father walked me through the whole confession. And at the end, he put his hands down like he was picking up a lamb. And he put it over his shoulders. And he said to her, all of heaven rejoices when the lost lamb is found. Welcome home. For the very first time in my life, I felt alive and in love. Welcome home. Welcome home. So we want to ask the Lord for the grace, the grace to heal, the desire to heal. As Father mentioned, um, there, is, there is a complete obstacle to healing, and that's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is very much um, holding on to, to someone else's um, offense and not, not um, releasing them of it, which is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is saying, Jesus, I give you this person's debt. I know they can never pay it, ever. Um, I ask you to pay it and to give that person a blessing instead. That's what forgiveness is. But unforgiveness is kind of like, if I hold on to the bitter resentment and hatred, it's kind of like drinking poison and hoping someone else dies. But I'm the one drinking the poison. And so forgiveness is a gift I need to give to others so that I can receive it myself. We remember in the Our Father that we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's not like at the same time or like in a similar way, but forgive me my trespasses as in the same way that I forgive others. So the measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. So it's actually something the Lord commanded but he reverences our hearts and he reverences our experience and he gives us the grace. Um, the catechism affirms that it's not in our power to forget, forget an offense or to release it, to just stop feeling it, but the Holy Spirit will work in the heart that asks for this grace. So let's just close. We're gonna close in a prayer right now and we're just gonna close and ask for this grace. Ask for whatever grace the Lord, you in coming here tonight, um, however you heard about it, however you, whatever attracted you to it. Um, if you just were here for the chili, which was delicious. Um, God wanted you here and he has something to say and give you uh, for your freedom and for your joy. So let's just ask for that grace right now together. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat>
Holy Spirit, we thank you for being present in this room, uh, for your knowledge of us, just the intimate knowledge of our hearts and our histories and our families, our regrets, um, our desires. And I just ask Holy Spirit, uh, come. Come into our minds, come into our memories. And if there is someone that I need to forgive, uh, please bring that person to mind. If there's someone who is in need of my forgiveness, please bring them to mind. We just ask for the grace to be able to um, want the good of this person. I want to release them. I want to be freed of the bitterness or the, um, the hurt, the pain associated with uh, the offense. We ask for this grace of forgiveness. And then we ask um, if there is a, something in my life, a memory, an event, an exchange, a relationship, if there's something in my life where I have not forgiven myself, just ask Holy Spirit, please light up that place in my life where I need to forgive myself and release myself of a debt I cannot pay. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Please continue to work in our hearts to stir us to greater freedom that we would be saints, that we would be um, other Christ, that we would also be able to um, live this divine love that is so far um, beyond, you know, beyond our wildest imaginings. Let us live it, experience it, taste it, bestow it on others. So we close with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray to the Father as we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I'm just going to be passing something out or have the sisters help me, but this is a synopsis of more that I would have liked to have said but didn't um, have time to, so thank you. <laughs>